thankful for the love that you've extended to us and the grace that you've given. Father, in spite of the fact that we never deserved it, we couldn't earn it, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, who willingly came to this earth and took upon himself human flesh and became obedient to death on the cross. Father, we recognize today the only reason that we are here, the only reason that we can be in a relationship with you is because you sent Jesus to accomplish everything that was needed so that our sins could be forgiven and we could have new life in you. And Father, I pray uh, today as we spend a few minutes in your word that you would help us to understand what that life is all about. Help us to understand what it truly means to be followers of Jesus. God, we recognize as we come into the room this morning, many of us do with different burdens on our hearts, different things weighing us down. We recognize, Father, we need you at work in us. And so I pray that you would accomplish your work this morning. May we be different as a result of our encounter with you and the reality of who you are and all that you've done for us. And it's in the name of our Savior Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, you guys can grab a seat. It's good to see everyone uh, this morning. I know we've got some guests here. I met a few of you on, on the way in. Um, but if I didn't get a chance to meet you yet, my name is Bill, and it's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at the table. And, you know, we always, we know it's, it's a little bit weird when you're a first-time guest with us, whether that's either watching online or here in the room, not really sure what to expect. Um, but we are glad that you're here, and hopefully we will make your experience as easy and as friendly as possible. But we would absolutely love to connect with you. And the easiest way to do that. Um, is to text the word welcome to 817-755-1668. We're not going to do anything weird. We're not going to show up at your house or anything like that. We'll just, you'll get an email from me tomorrow that says, hey, thanks for being here. Here's a little bit more about who we are as a church. We just want to follow up with you and, you know, figure out if we can uh, encourage you and your family or help you in your um, faith, develop that a little bit. Whatever we can do, we want to be able to do that. We're really um, honored that you have chosen uh, to be here and to worship with us uh, today. You know, I was thinking about this uh, recently. There are many events in our lives that we would consider to be life-changing events. I just want you to think back over some of those in your own life. I, I think about things that I've experienced in my life, and I go back to when I turned 16 and was able to get my driver's license. That was kind of a life-changing event event for the first time. I had all this new freedom, so I wasn't dependent upon my parents to take me around to the places that I wanted to go. And so being able to drive to school and drive to practices and all of that, it was just so much better than what it was before. It was like a whole new world, and it was really, really exciting. Another one, uh, another life-changing event is, was high school graduation. It was one chapter ending, another chapter beginning, and I can remember, literally I did this, walking in the parking lot out to my car after graduation from high school thinking, man, I'm so glad that that's done, now I'm ready to move on to something else. Another life-changing event for a lot of people is then college graduation. And when you graduate from college, most people, that means that they get their first real job entering into the workforce, as they have money maybe for the first time in their life. Um, for me, it was a little bit different uh, when I graduated from college, and I was really excited to graduate from college because I was kind of done with that chapter, um, but I was really nervous about what the new chapter would bring because that was when I moved from Ohio down to Dallas to begin uh, seminary there, and so I was moving all of the people that I knew and the places that I knew to come to this new place where I didn't really know anybody, so I was a little bit nervous about what that would um, entail, but it was definitely, for me, a life-changing event. Getting married is another one. Uh, so for those of you that are married, you know how that changed your life. And then you know, for those of you that have had the privilege of having children, you know that when you look back at all of those other events that you thought changed everything about your life, you realize that they didn't actually change everything because when you had kids, literally everything in your life changes. I can remember before we had kids, like when Mandy was pregnant, people would tell us, oh, having kids can change your life. And I was really naive, and I thought to myself, like, listen, it can't be that hard. Like, lots of people do this all the time, so it can't be that big of a deal. And then we had kids, and it did absolutely change everything. I can remember how hard it was in the very beginning 
uh, especially with Nathan. Nathan was not a good baby. He's over here in the front, so he's really disappointed that I'm talking about him this morning. But like he just cried all the time, and he would never go to sleep. And we found out after a few weeks it was uh, because his stomach hurt all the time. And so the only thing that we could do to get him to go to sleep was bounce him like hard on an exercise ball. Like that was the only thing that would get him to, to go to sleep, especially when he was really, really small. Then as he got a little bit older, you know, like the people are like, oh, you got to let them cry it out. They need to learn to soothe themselves and they'll fall asleep in their own bed. Listen, that never worked. Like two, three hours of crying, eventually we'd have to go in and do something. And it got to the point where on a couple of different occasions, I would get in the crib with him because that was the only thing that would calm him down and get him to lay down and go to sleep. Caroline was a lot better uh, as a baby, but she's had her moments too. And I, mean, I just think like, Parenting is hard. And those of you that have children, you know that. It's, it, there's, I don't feel like there's ever a time where it's like easy, you got it all figured out. It's hard. And it absolutely changes everything about your life. But as I look back on Nathan just turned 14 this last week, so over the last 14 years, how life has dramatically changed, is dramatically different. I think of all the challenges that we faced, the difficulties that we had, and all of those things. I would say this, yes, parenting is hard, but it is absolutely worth it. This is the third week of our series that we're calling The Road Less Traveled. And what we're doing in this series is talking about how Jesus has called us as his followers to be different. And I wonder if I would have started the message uh, this morning by doing a little bit of a survey and saying, hey, tell me one event that you've experienced that changed your life. I wonder what you would have come up with. Likely, if I would have taken time to do that, you'd probably come up with some of the things that I mentioned, the life-changing events that I've experienced. But I wonder if anybody would have said, and the day that I trusted Christ as my Savior, that was the day that changed everything. Sadly, for most people, it's probably not the case. It's not necessarily a day that changed everything in your life. And maybe part of the reason for that is the message that was presented on the day that you came to faith in Christ, where maybe the message was far more about what happens when you die than it is about changing how you live. And so what happens then is that people just kind of keep doing all the things that they've done, and they take Jesus and put him up on a shelf like a little token that allows you to get into the special club called heaven when you die. And it doesn't change anything. But that's not what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's so much more than that. Following Jesus, absolutely, it should change everything in our lives. That's what I want to talk about today. So if you've got a Bible, I would invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 9. We're looking at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. If you don't have a Bible, it will be on the screen as I read it here in just a second. Or, um, like always, I want to point you to the YouVersion Bible app in our live event. I mean, I would encourage you to follow along there. If you don't have um, something else, if you've got your smartphone, you can get it out. And then you can look at Facebook and all the other things that you want to do. And it just looks like you're following along. And so it's not going to bother anybody. But this passage is about three call stories of prospective disciples. They are nameless prospective disciples. Now, earlier this year, we looked at a couple of call stories Probably the two most famous call stories are, are we've looked at in our services. And so remember, there's the, the call of Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He went fishing with Jesus after fishing all night and catching nothing. That next day, there's this miraculous catch of fish. And Jesus says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And so then Peter left everything and followed Jesus. Just a couple of verses later, we read the call story of Matthew, who was sitting in his tax collector's booth, and Jesus came by and said to this tax collector, follow me, and Matthew got up and left everything and followed Jesus. So you read those two stories, it's really easy to think, well, this must have been everyone's experience or every disciple's experience. Like as soon as Jesus offers that call, immediately they just leave everything behind and they begin to follow Jesus. But that's not the case. And we'll see that in the text that we're looking at this morning. So let me read these verses, Luke 9, 57 through 62. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
Then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he told him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. These three perspective disciples and their call stories, I think that they're really so interesting. And they're different too, right? On the first and the third, it's the prospective disciple who initiates the conversation. The middle one is initiated by Jesus, where he gives the invitation, follow me. What's really important to see, I want you to see this up front, what Jesus is not doing is going out into this crowd saying, who wants to go to heaven when you die? It was far more than that. He was saying, who wants to be my follower? Who wants to be my disciple? So often we get stuck thinking that being a follower of Jesus is all about what happens to us when we die, but it is so much more than that. And so before we actually get into these three stories, these call experiences for these prospective disciples, I want to define what a disciple is for us. And so for those of you that have been through Formed, which is kind of our starting point class as a church, it's our our pathway to partnership. Sometimes churches call it membership, but it's some intentional language for us. Or for those of you that have just been around for a while, hopefully you have heard this definition of a disciple communicated before. And so I just want to reinforce it, hopefully, for most of us. But being a disciple of Jesus or a follower of Jesus includes three things. First, A disciple is someone who has faith in Jesus or someone who believes in Jesus. That's the starting point. It's a person who recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God who is our Messiah or our Savior. It's someone who recognizes that the only way to have a relationship with God is because of what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. It's through what he did that our sins could be forgiven. And so when we could do nothing, Jesus did everything. That's what allows us to have a relationship with God. And that's where being a follower of Jesus starts. It starts with our belief in Jesus. Now, a lot of people think that that's where it ends, but that is only the starting point. So that's first, a disciple is one who believes in Jesus. The second it, part of a definition of a disciple is that a disciple is one whose life is being shaped by Jesus. This is really inherently in what it means to be a disciple. In the first century, lots of rabbis had disciples, and these were often young men that would travel around with that master teacher to learn from him, but the expectation was not just, I'm learning information, but I'm learning information to take it and apply it to my life so that I am learning from and living differently as a result of this teacher, and that's what we are supposed to do. Following Jesus is supposed to shape who we are. It changes our lives. So that throughout the course of our lives, we get better at reflecting the character of Jesus in all that we do. Listen, if your faith isn't making a difference in your life, what good is the faith that you say you have? Because a disciple is one whose life is being shaped by Jesus. So a disciple is one who believes in Jesus, whose life is being shaped by Jesus. And then the third part is that a disciple is one who helps others to follow Jesus too. And this really goes back to the call of Peter, where Jesus said to him, Peter, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. He was giving him a new job. Instead of being a fisherman, he would fish for men and help them to understand what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. But that call, that the language was unique to Peter as a fisherman, it is given to all of us. As followers of Jesus, what we are supposed to be doing is helping to point other people back to Jesus, help them to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We have gifts and abilities, talents, our personality, all of those things that God has given to us we are to use to help others understand what it means to follow Jesus too. So that's what a disciple is. It's someone who has, uh, believes in Jesus, whose life is being shaped by Jesus, and one who is helping others to follow Jesus too. And I want you to understand how significant that understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is. And it is that understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus that helps us helps to inform us in what is happening in the passage that we're looking at today with these call stories of these prospective disciples. 
Because it's really interesting in, in what we read, what is said, what is not said, all of those things. And we're going to talk about some of that. But it is these three accounts that help us to understand how following Jesus changes everything. So I'm going to give you three things based on what we read in these three call stories, how following Jesus changes everything. First, following Jesus demands that putting ourselves first is a thing of the past. It is interesting to me to think about what is said in these call stories, what is not said, why what is said is said. You know, one of the things that as we look at this, we don't know if, if this happened a lot as Jesus is just traveling along and crowds are gathered. He was just picking people out of the crowd saying, follow me, follow me. We don't know that. All we know is what we read in this passage. And we know that at least on this one occasion, there were these three different encounters. And so the first, the first person says, Jesus, I'll follow you. And the response of Jesus is, Well, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We don't read why that was the response of Jesus. We don't read really anything that led up to it. It's just, hey, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, I have no place to lay my head. And so as a result of that, we're left to kind of, in some sense, read between the lines a little bit. And so it must have been that Jesus understood what was in this man's heart when he said, I want to be your father. Maybe for this man, he recognized Jesus as this really famous teacher. He saw the crowds who were gathered listening to Jesus teach that day. And, and so maybe he had also heard of Jesus' miracles and the things that he had done. And so here he was thinking to himself, well, man, if I become his follower, it's going to mean a lot for me. Maybe it means prestige for me. Status for me, power for me. But Jesus' point was, listen, it's not about you. Whatever you think becoming my follower is, it's not about that because it's really not about you. But our culture, we live in a world that says life is all about me. I've Uh, run into people before and they've said to me, listen, I know God wants me to be happy. And so that idea, it's all about me, it bleeds into our faith. And so I've had people say, I know God wants me to be happy. And so I need to do what makes me happy. That's what God wants for me. Sometimes that idea that it's all about me causes us to have a really kind of like buy into this really bad form of faith. It kind of says, like, I know that as a follower of God or a believer in Jesus, that God's going to do all these things for me. God's going to take away all my problems. God's going to bless me financially. God's going to make my life really easy. It's kind of the idea of, like, like why would I get into this thing if I'm not going to get benefits out of it anyway? But following Jesus is not about you. And following Jesus demands that we not put ourselves first all the time. Listen, if you are following Jesus and you are at the center of your own faith story, you're doing something, but it's not following Jesus. Because it's not about what you get out of it. And understand, God has done a lot of great things for you, and he will continue to do great things for you, but it's not about you. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, He says, think not only about your own interests, but the interests of others. And kind of our understanding of what he was talking about is like, we need to put the needs of others first. And then he says this, have this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who willingly laid down his life for us. It's not so much about what God wants to do for us, but ultimately what he wants to do in us and how he remakes our lives. It's very different than what's happening in the world around us. And so Jesus changes everything. Following Jesus changes everything in that it demands that putting ourselves first be a thing of the past. Number two, how does following Jesus change everything? What we find is that Jesus should transcend everything in our lives. Jesus must transcend everything. The second encounter with this uh, 
second perspective disciple. He, uh, this is now initiated by Jesus in verse 59. He says to another, follow me. And this man says, Lord, let me go back and bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. But at you, as for you, you proclaim the kingdom of God. The response of Jesus might seem really strange to us, like almost insensitive. Like, it's not unreasonable to let this man go and bury his father. I mean, attend his father's funeral. Like, why would Jesus say what he did? And so we got to understand a little bit of the culture to understand this interaction. See, likely, based on burial practices in the first century, it was likely that this man's father was still alive. If he had, in fact, passed away, the man would have been so busy in preparation for his father's burial that he wouldn't have had time for this interaction with Jesus. He would not have been out amongst the crowd that day. And so then the question is, well, what's happening? What was his motivation in saying, let me go bury my father? It's possible that he was saying, I have some things that I want to do first or some responsibilities that I feel like I need to take care of first. When the time is right, then I'll follow you. Now, the text doesn't say this, and so I want to be a little bit careful. It's it's not for sure, but it's entirely possible that this man was thinking, I'm going to wait until I receive my inheritance, and then I'd be willing to follow Jesus. Because if he just heard this previous interaction, hey, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. It's entirely possible that this second prospective disciple is thinking to himself, that's not the life that I want for myself. I want to make sure that I'm taken care of. And so if I get that inheritance, that's enough to make sure that I have a place to lay my head if this being a follower of Jesus thing doesn't really work out. It's a golden parachute. But Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. As for you, you proclaim the kingdom Here's what we understand. Jesus must transcend everything in our lives. Over the years, I've talked to people in like challenging circumstances. They find, them, find themselves in challenging circumstances in their lives. Oftentimes, it's relational, you know, struggles happening. And I, I've said on a few occasions, like, what do you think happened? Like, how did you end up here? And on several occasions, I've had people say, you know what, I just got my priorities out of whack. I wasn't putting God first in my life. And it sounds like a great answer, but I have started to wonder recently, what does that actually mean? See, I used to do this. I've done this a couple of times when teaching in, in, in different settings. I'll say, take a piece of paper and write down the top three priorities in your life. You know, oftentimes people write like spouse, kids, job, something along those lines. So I'll give, give a minute to let you think about that, and then I'll say, okay, so now do this. Write Jesus at the top of your list because he is to be the number one priority in your life. But I've started to rethink that a little bit because I'm not honestly sure how helpful that is. Because my fear is what we can do by thinking that that's how we're going to do it. We just write Jesus at the top of the list. What we do is that we just start doing things for Jesus and we just add stuff to our lives. Now, things that are really good, like reading your Bible, praying, serving, giving. I mean, these are things that we should all be doing. It's part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But I will tell you this, putting Jesus first in your life doesn't just mean adding things to your to-do list. Because following Jesus changes everything. And so I've started to think a little bit differently. Rather than writing Jesus on the top of your list, think about it this way. Write Jesus over your list. So you make the priorities, you write them down, and then you write Jesus on top of those three things because that's what it means to put Jesus first. He transcends everything in our lives so that we begin to think, okay, what does it mean that I am following Jesus? How does that interplay with how I should treat my spouse? Or what does that mean for how I interact with my children? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus when I get up and go to work on Monday morning and how I go about my job? Because when you begin to think that way, Jesus transcending everything in your life, it will change everything. Following Jesus changes everything in that putting myself first has to be a thing of the past 
Second, we understand that Jesus must transcend everything. And then number three, understand you can't hold on to your former way of life. Verse 61, another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You can't look back. You can't hold on to the past. Because Jesus calls us to be different. It is really easy to want to hold on to the things of the past. To even think sometimes maybe the way that we had it was better. It's really easy to fall back into the same patterns that we've had before, the the same way of life that we had before coming to faith in Christ, to deal with pressures and stress the same way that we dealt with them before. But Jesus has called us to be different. We can't hold on to the things of the past. Jesus calls us to move forward and be different. But understand, being a follower of Jesus is hard. Simple, but difficult. Because it's hard to surrender everything on a daily basis. And when we go through difficulties, and we will go through difficulties, we will face tests of faith. Inevitably, they will come. And when we face those challenges in our lives, it will be easy to fall back into the old patterns where we feel like anger or control is better than surrender, but it's not. It's really easy to think that alcohol, to numb the pain or to make it through the stresses that we face in life is better, but it's not. We will think that the old way is better, but it's not because Jesus has called us into freedom. In the book of Exodus, we read about Moses being called by God to go rescue the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. So miraculously, they escape Egypt, and they begin their journey toward the promised land. And it didn't take very long at all, but the people began to complain. They didn't have enough water. They didn't like the food. And some began to say, why did we even come out here? We should have stayed in Egypt. They were saying, I think slavery is better. But listen, slavery is never better than freedom. I don't care how good you were treated as a slave. Slavery is not better than freedom. It doesn't matter how hard it is understanding what living in freedom is all about. Slavery is never better than freedom. And we have been set free because of the work of Jesus for us. And Jesus calls us to a brand new life. And we should never look back holding on to those things. Because freedom is better. See, Jesus doesn't just change some things. Following Jesus changes everything. There's a recent Gallup survey that was just released within the last couple of weeks that said for the first time in the history of our country, more citizens of our country are not affiliated with church than those that would say that they are affiliated with church. So for the first time in history, more people do not go to church, don't affiliate with church than those that do. This survey is incredibly concerning to a lot of people in Christian leadership across the country, asking questions like, what is happening? How did we get here? Why did we get here? People writing articles about that. And so I read one a couple of weeks ago that I thought was really, really interesting. And this author, he said that what he feels like is happening, because Oftentimes, it's younger people that are leaving the church or not affiliating with church anymore. And it's not people from the outside. These are young people that grew up in the church, and they started to look around at people inside the church, often at leaders inside the church. And all they see are hypocrites and Pharisees. People who say one thing and say, hey, this is the way that we're supposed to be, and this is how we're supposed to live, and this is what we're supposed to do, but then they're doing something very different. And if that's all that we are, what good are we? And I pray that that would never be the case about any of us here. Because following Jesus, it's not just some stuff to add to our calendars or our schedules. It's to bring about a radical difference 
in our lives. It doesn't just change some things. It changes everything. Now, is it hard? Yes. Regularly, it is hard. But I promise, as you begin to follow Jesus with everything that you have, and you look back on the good and the bad and the challenges, whatever you've gone through, you will say, man, it's been hard, but it is absolutely worth it. And so here's the challenge I'm going to leave you with today. I want to go back to those priorities. And I want you to think about the top three priorities in your life. And what does it mean for you not to just write Jesus at the top of the list, but to write Jesus over that list? What are the changes that you need to make so that following Jesus doesn't just change some things in your life, but changes everything? Because that's what it means to be a disciple. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, this is where we need you. Because on our own, we wouldn't even be able to see the changes that need to take place in our lives. But through the power of your Spirit at work in us, you reveal things to us and you help us to understand how to live. And so, Father, for those of us who have a tendency to put ourselves first, God, I pray that you would expose those areas of our lives when we need to say no to me and yes to you. I pray that Jesus would transcend everything in our lives, that he would intersect everything that we do. And Father, in those moments where we're tempted to go back and hold on to a former way of life or something that we used to do for, for, for comfort or whatever it is, God, remind us that you've given us a new life and you have set us free from our sin. So we don't have to hold on to those things anymore, but we just continue to passionately pursue you with everything that we have. God, forgive us for making faith about us when it's never meant to be about us because it is all about you. Father, I pray that we as a church would be different and that who we are would be a reflection of who you are as we interact with other people and that they would look at us and say, what is it? What has made the difference? And we can point people back to you. The one who willingly laid down his life. And not just change some things, but to change everything. And it's in the name that is above every name. The name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of the Father. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus, that we pray.